It is my great pleasure tonight to introduce our evening speaker, Erica Mann Jong. Erica Jong is a poet, novelist, and essayist, best known for her eight New York Times best-selling novels, Fear of Flying, which has sold 26 million copies in more than 40 languages. How to Save Your Own Life, Fanny, being the true history of the adventures of Fanny Hackabout Jones, Parachutes and Kisses, Shylock's Daughter, previous, previously called Serenissima, Any Woman's Blues, Inventing Memory, and Sappho's Leap. Her midlife memoir, Fear of 50, remains a major international bestseller. Ms. Zhang is also the author of seven award-winning collections of poetry. Her latest, Love Comes First, was released by Tartar Penguin in January 2009. Ms. Jong is also the author of several nonfiction books. Her work has appeared all over the world. Known for her commitment to women's rights, copyright, and free expression, Ms. Jong is a frequent lecturer in the United States and abroad. She was president of the Authors Guild and now serves on its board. She has established a program for young writers here at Barnard. Columbia University, where she, where she received her MA in 18th century English literature, acquired her literary archive in 2008. Erica has been honored with the United Nations Award for Excellence in Literature, Poetry Magazine's Best Hoken Prize, and the Deauville Award in France. In Italy, she has received the Sigmund Freud Award and the first Fernanda Pivano Prize, named for the woman who introduced Ernest Hemingway Allen Ginsberg and Erica Jong to Italy. Ms. Jong is working on a novel featuring a woman of a certain age. Fear of Flying is in preparation uh, as a BBC miniseries. Sugar in My Bowl is her first anthology. Erica, even before all these many accomplishments, when you were but one of us, a fellow student at Barnard, you were noticed and admired. Those among us who were with you in Eleanor Rosenberg's 17th century poetry class, noticed and admired you. We out-of-towners who lived in the dorms on campus jumped into whatever clothes were handy before racing off to class. But in you walked, Erica Mann, with your wonderful hair, stylish clothes, and what was particularly amazing to us, high heels. <laughs> on top of all this, invariably, you contributed perceptive and thoughtful observations on the assigned poems. Erica, we admired your style and intellect then, and as fellow alums, we have admired and taken pride in your many accomplishments, accomplishments ever since. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to present Erica Mann Jong. Oops. I may be ageless, but I can no longer wear stilettos. <laughs> you know, this, this theme, I had these wonderful conversations with Susan Meister about the theme of agelessness. But I had no idea what a difficult topic this was until I began doing the research, you know, like a good, well-trained Barnard girl. I started to research agelessness, and I found it a most difficult subject. Actually, the best quote I found on agelessness comes from the great jazz musician Satchel Paige. How old, how old would you be if you didn't know how old you were? <laughs> And I want to take that line as my theme. All of us know people who seem not to let the constraints of time hold them back. We all know women who remarry at 85, <laughs> even though they've buried many husbands. <laughs> what is this quality that people who exhibit agelessness have. I suspect it's hope. My husband and I, my fourth husband, who I've been married to now for 23 years, and I'm his fourth wife, um, 
When we decided to get married, people at our wedding in Vermont were actually taking bets that it wouldn't last six months. We only found this out recently from our cousins who hadn't dared to tell us. But people were taking bets that it wouldn't work out for us. On our wedding announcement, we wrote the, the date we were married and all of that, and we stamped in red ink on top a triumph of hope over experience. <laughs> And it, it, the people who go on remaining ageless are people who have an abundance of hope. Here is the world that we live in. It's a world of virtual friends on Facebook. It's a world in which people are glued to their cellular phones. I personally think virtual friend is an oxymoron. I mean, I... <laughs> I now have something like 1,400 virtual friends. The only reason I have that many virtual friends is because for my new book, I employed a social media guru, and he friends everyone who writes, <laughs> this is insane, but who writes, they love my work, so he friends them. But, I don't think there is such a thing as a virtual friend, really. I can count my true friends on the fingers of one hand. But this hopefulness, this sense of possibility, is really what keeps you young. And it's really hard to hold on to it. I mean, it really is hard to find, to hold on to it. Many of us have reached the age when we see grandchildren growing up in a world very different from the world we knew. Communications are different, education is different, and yet the desire to pass on what we know is not different. If we are really lucky, we've reached the age of generativity. And that is the joy of giving back, of passing along what we have. Probably generativity is the most precious part of growing older. If we get old enough to experience this empathy, this desire to pass along what we know, in truth, we're very, very lucky. Not long ago, I took my seven-year-old grandson to Rome. He said to me, Grandma Erica, you love Italy. I have spring break. I need to see the Colosseum. <laughs> this is Max Greenfield, age seven. He's been studying Roman soldiers and, and um, Spartan soldiers, and he's told me that Spartan soldiers had to catch their own food in the woods, and he had to see the Colosseum. So I took him to Rome, and I never had as good a time in Rome in my whole life as seeing Max Greenfield, age seven, discover Rome. We even went to gladiator school. My daughter found a gladiator school on the Via Antica, and we went there and they taught him the moves that a gladiator makes. The first move you have to decapitate your opponent. <laughs> If that doesn't work, you try to hit your opponent in the ribs. If that doesn't work, you try to sever your opponent's Achilles tendon, because once you have your opponent on the ground, he's yours. And it was really funny watching Max fencing with a wooden sword with his, with his gladiatorial teacher. Anyway, that was probably gave me more pleasure than anything in my life. The only thing that has been equally fun is this writing program at Barnard, which I've set up, which is really a peer tutoring program. The young women take a course in editing, and then they are put out to pastures, so to speak, to help other people all over the school write term papers. And of course, if you learn to edit, you learn to edit yourself. So it's a program in which 
you learn by helping others how to write. And it's given me so much joy to be able to give money to keep this program going. I don't choose the fellows, the girl fellows, um, but often I meet them when they're about to graduate. I've given little luncheons for them. And they are just staggeringly wonderful young women. Not all of them want to be writers. One of them was going off to medical school in Israel. But they will all do something with that writing. And that I know. And it's given me such pleasure to be able to give back to Barnard, because Barnard was the place where I came to know I was a writer. Maybe some of you have heard this story. I was taking zoology 1-2, a 10-point course, thinking I was going to be a pre-med student. And I had come to the point where I had to dissect the fetal pig. And I looked down at this creature on my platter, and it looked like a human baby. And I dissected it all wrong, and I began to cry. And I remember going to Bob Pack, my poetry teacher, and saying, I'll never be a doctor. I can't dissect the fetal pig. And he said, never mind, never mind. You'll be a writer. <laughs> anyway, one of the things that makes it so hard to hold on to hope, which is the thing that keeps you young, I truly believe, is that we live in the United States of amnesia. This is, that's a line of Gore Vidal's, which I love. History in the United States is perhaps this thick. What do we do about the fact that many of the battles we fought for women are unknown, reversed, or now discarded? What do we do about all the young women who say, I'm not a feminist, but? Often, we live, not only do we live in the United States of amnesia, but we live in a place where everything is forgotten too soon and our history is unknown. But we have a role there, too. We need to bear witness to the changes we've seen. We need to remember how much the younger generations need us. We are their historians. We are their witnesses. We are their boosters, their mothers, their grandmothers. They need us, and they particularly need our agelessness. The story of women reaching out for liberty goes back a long, long way. It begins in the Enlightenment with the question of whether the rights of man can also be the rights of woman. This question is as relevant now as it was when we were younger. Perhaps it is more relevant now because the rights of women keep getting lost in the shuffle. We've seen a terrible time with the legislatures of many, many states in the United States taking back the right to choice, despite the fact that's been proven again and again in every UN report on the status of women, that when women can control their fertility, the, um, the stature of the community goes up economically, culturally, in every sense. Why do these truths, which have been proven again and again, keep getting lost in the shuffle? I think that of all the problems that afflict our country, our historylessness is the worst and the most dangerous. We, now the elders, embody memory. And we must share what we know. We have a job to do here. And this is our most important role. Rather than complaining about our supposed invisibility, we need to become memory and history for a world too apt to throw memory away. We need memory, so elders are essential. Now that we are the el ageless elders, we must learn to communicate with the young 
so that they can hear us. It's impossible to write about agelessness in prose. The fact that we are all ages simultaneously, that we swim backward in time as we age, that we speak to our grandchildren in the voices of our parents. This is really important. We know on some level that neither age nor time really exists. There are warnings, though. In Greek mythology, those who try to defeat time are usually punished. Those who get immortality without also wishing for youth, like Tithonus, get older and older and older and cannot die. Only the gods are immortal, and they don't seem to use their immortality very well. Can it be that immortality is boring? From the Greek myths, it would seem so. The gods are cranky, and they play tricks on humans out of their boredom. The moral seems to be that we must accept our mortality. Not long ago, a few nights ago, I went out to BAM to see this new production of King Lear from the Donmar warehouse in London. And I understood Lear in a new way, in a way I never could have understood it when I was at Barnard. And what I saw was a man, Lear, a king who was full of arrogance and had no empathy. And I saw that in order to achieve that great quality of empathy, he had to be reduced, 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 because only when he lost everything, including his beloved daughter, could he see that he was, that could he achieve the quality of empathy. Lear starts out grandiose, and he find, and he becomes humble. Only in his humility does he find wisdom. And perhaps that's what the process of aging does for us. We are not arrogant like those gods who never die. We are prone to all kinds of fleshly decrepitude. And you think, why? It seems not fair. We should be as free of any kind of problems as we were when we were young. But the truth is, that only with the decay of our powers do we become humble enough to allow wisdom in. I see that in myself. I see myself understanding now things that I never understood when I was at Barnard. And really, I only understand them with the approach of my own demise. Perhaps aging is given to us specifically to show us humility. When we are young, we understand absolutely no restriction. And I think that this, this yearning for eternal life, for looking young for the rest of your life, is looking for something that would deprive you of having the kind of wisdom we need as we get older. So for me, agelessness means generativity. It means the ability to take my Max to Rome and hear his response to it. And it also means the desire to have hope no matter how hopeless the world is and to try to pass that along to my grandchildren and to the other young people that I love, I feel that I have a valuable role now as a witness and a teacher. Perhaps it's harder than it ever was, but it seems to me that that quality of hope, that quality of exuberance, because it's harder won, is more important now than it ever was. Not long ago, I was going through a very dark time in my life. I couldn't figure out how to finish this novel. 
and I was feeling very, very sad. And I would wake up every morning thinking, what comes next in the book? I don't know what comes next. And a friend gave me a prayer to help me. And this was the prayer. Days pass and the years vanish and we walk sightless among miracles. Lord, fill our eyes with seeing and our minds with knowing. Let there be moments when the lightning of your presence illumines the darkness in which we walk. It's a Hebrew Sabbath prayer reconfigured in English poetry. But the line that stayed with me was sightless among miracles. And I think it's very important that we open our eyes to the miracles around us, the ordinary miracles, the splendid miracles, the miracle of getting older and having this empathy become younger within you. Um, the miracle of generativity, which we could never have had when we were young. The miracle of teaching a new generation what they need to know about, about their own history. And as I get older, I want to teach more and more. I feel that I have a reason to help the next generation. So I don't want to be sightless among these miracles. I want to see the miracles around me. And one of the miracles that I see is the expansion of empathy that comes to you only as you get older. Thank you. If you have a few minutes, I think we could entertain some questions. If people have some questions that they would like to um, share with you. You want to come back up so they can hear you? <laughs> Are there any questions that anyone would like to, to raise? OK. Um, I don't know. I never, I never saw a silent Barnard woman. I don't know. <laughs> no silent Barnard women. <laughs> Yes. You have a question. You don't have to have a question if you'd rather have dinner. <laughs> Thank you so much for your ah uh, question. Here we go. Oh, I, I'm Judy Hamilton. I was at Barnard two years, and then I transferred to Smith. And we had a, when I, two weeks ago, when I was at my Smith 50th reunion, we had a, a panel. And for some reason, I was, it was on passion, your present passion. I couldn't think of anything I'd been passionate about. But anyway, I was on the panel. But one of my uh, comments, I was talking about traveling. And one of the things I said was that we are in such an amazing, wonderful world. And you, if you look around you and you see all the, the wonders of nature and, and the wonders of man and the accomplishments that man has done and the beauties of nature, you can't help but being awed about this. And it just, it, I think that keeps you young and if, so often we forget about that. We get tired into the uh, <laughs> ordinary things of life. And you know, if we can just keep that in our mind, it, it just, life is so exciting. So I hope you all feel that way too. Well, I do, yes. Erica, I do agree that we are in danger of losing some of the things we worked so hard for. Yes. How would you suggest that this generation does something about it? 
I, look, I think that we, we really have to refight our revolution for choice, our revolution for women's rights. And we have to understand why the things we achieve keep slipping away for women. Um, women seem to not understand that unless we support each other, we can't make our advances stay. Women hook their, their fates to men instead of to each other. And we really have to learn how to bond together. I believe that mentoring is the new feminism. And if each of you could mentor a young woman and give to her, she doesn't have to be a relative of yours, she might be, give to her the kind of confidence in women that we all received at Barnard and be a witness to the changes that have gone on for women. That would be enough. But we have to find a way to reactivate our movement in a new way. And it should not be a movement that attacks men. That's a dead end for us. It should be a movement that inspires younger women and brings men into it to help us. There are plenty of male feminists. So I'd like to see that happen. I'd like to help inspire that to happen. I think it's really important. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'll have to come back again in, in two years when my class of 63 has its 50th reunion. Thank you. Enjoy your dinner, and thanks for your hospitality.